Okay, so I'd like to, to maybe start by thanking uh, the organizers of the seminars for, for inviting me. It's of course a great, a great pleasure. So the title of the talk is A New Instability for a Higher Dimensional Black Holes. So I understand that some of the, of the people in the audience may be not uh, familiar with the Einstein equations and general relativity. So I try to assume as little knowledge as possible about general relativity, but if I say anything that sounds unclear or unfamiliar to you, please stop me and ask, and ask questions. Okay, so let me start with an answer of what I'll be talking about in the, in the talk. So the vacuum Einstein equations and general relativity can be formulated in four dimensions as well as in, in higher dimensions. So I'll start by reviewing some well-known facts about the vacuum Einstein equations, black holes and their classical stability in both four and, and higher dimensions. So in the context of, of stability, we'd be particularly interested in comparing stability properties of four dimensional uh, stationary black holes to those of higher dimensional black holes. So while in four dimensions, all stationary vacuum black holes are believed to belong to, to a single family of black holes, which is known as the curve family, and they're expected to be uh, dynamically stable, in higher dimensions, there exists a whole zoo of new stationary vacuum solutions, and some of these new solutions are expected to be unstable. So to better understand these novel uh, aspects of higher dimensional general relativity, we'll, in the second part of the talk, we'll focus on a particular uh, family of unstable uh, stationary vacuum black holes in higher dimensions. And this family is known as the family of black rings. So I review some of the known, uh, briefly review some of the known instabilities for this family, and then I claim the existence of a new instability for black rings and describe its main, its main features. So let me already tell you that this instability will be new in the sense that it's never been uh, observed for, for black rings or for other higher dimensional uh, black holes. But even more important, it will be for the first time in the context of black ring instabilities, it will be supported by, by mathematical theorem. And this, this theorem will, will appear in the second part of the talk and will be the main, the main result. So the third part of the talk will be about the claim that this new instability may be understood as a manifestation of a more uh, general instability that affects a more general class of space times that goes beyond black rings and other higher dimensional black holes. So the third part of the talk will be about trying to, to make sense of such, of such a claim. And the last part of the talk, I give you the main ideas and, and methods involved in the, in the proof of the, of the theorem that I state in the, second, in the second part. Okay, so we're good to start with part one. So broadly speaking, we'd be, uh, we'd be interested in the classical stability of black hole solutions to the vacuum Einstein equations, which g equal to, equal to zero. So everything I'll be saying will be, will be classical, so there will be no if you want quantum, uh, anything about the quantum nature of, this, of these objects. And I'll be, I'll be restricting to black hole, to black hole exterior uh, solutions. So let me uh, remind, let me recall briefly that for us the solutions to the, to the vacuum Einstein equations is the Lorenz manifold mg, where g is the Lorenz matrix. And we allow the dimension to be greater or equal than, than three plus one. So the Einstein equations will be, will be the vacuum equations because we're setting the right hand side of the equations to be equal to zero. And we're also setting the cosmological constant to be, to be equal to zero. Okay, so if one chooses coordinates on the Lorentz manifold mg, the, the vacuum Einstein equations become manifest the second order, a system of second order nonlinear partial differential equations. And it turns out that there exists a way to construct coordinates on the manifold mg so that such a system becomes a system of nonlinear wave equations in the Lorentz metric G. And this system of nonlinear wave equations turns out to, to admit a locally well-posed initial, initial value problem. So now the, the importance of the initial value formulation of general relativity and this well-posedness is that it gives the mathematical framework to study the dynamics and in particular the stability of, of solutions to the Einstein vacuum equation. Okay. So as I briefly mentioned at the start of the talk, we've been interested in the stability of solutions in, in higher dimensions. But before moving to that, let me recall what's the, what's the picture in, in the usual three plus one dimensional uh, setting. So the stability problem for the Einstein vacuum equations in three plus one dimensions. So the nonlinear stability for the trivial solution 
uh, namely the Minkowski space, has been established by the uh, celebrated work of Christodoulou Kleinemann and still remain, from the mathematical point of view, a very active area of, of research. On the other end, the stability for the, the nonlinear stability of the subextremal, uh, the, the family of subextremal curve uh, exteriors remains a mathematical conjecture open. And there has been a lot of recent progress on both the linear uh, stability and nonlinear stability problem for, for curve. So the curve stability, uh, the curve stability conjecture is, is often uh, considered as part of the wider and more general uh, conjecture known as the final state conjecture that claims that the curve, uh, the curve family is the, so the old stationary vacuum black holes are belong to the, belong to the, to the curve family and thus the curve family characterizes all the possible uh, stationary end state of black hole dynamics. Okay. So although we'd be, we'd be, uh, we'd be looking at the vacuum Einstein equation with zero cosmological constant, let me briefly recall what happens when one sets the, the, the cosmological constant to, to be negative for later, for later uh, comparison of the dimension later in the talk. So now we consider the vacuum Einstein equations with negative cosmological constant. The trivial solution is known as anti-de-sitter anti uh, space. And it turns out that with negative cosmological constant, one has to, to solve an initial boundary value problem for the Einstein vacuum equation. So some boundary conditions need to be, to be set. And the claim is that if, if, if reflective boundary conditions are assumed at infinity, then the trivial solution anti the sitter space is expected to be no linearly unstable. And the same being true for the corresponding family of current yes, black holes. Again, once reflective boundary conditions are assumed. So here the boundary condition, the one, the one assumes are important. And in fact, if different boundary conditions are, are assumed, like for instance, dissipative boundary conditions, then these solutions here can be expected to be non-linearly stable. Okay. Okay, good. So let's move to higher dimensional uh, general relativity. So higher dimensional GR is very uh, interesting from the point of view of theoretical of theoretical physics, but it's of course also interesting from the mathematical uh, point of view to, to study whether certain, uh, whether dynamical properties of solutions to a certain system of PDEs, like for instance, in our case, the vacuum Einstein equations, depend on the number of dimensions the one, the one considers. And it is indeed the case that for the vacuum Einstein equations, the dynamics of solutions in, in higher dimensions it turns out to be richer than the, than the dynamics in, in three plus one dimensions. And many of these novel, novel properties already show up in four plus one dimensions. So in just one dimension, if you want higher than the usual three plus one dimensional, dimensional setting. So the two main new, new feature of higher dimensional uh, general relativity, the one already sees in five dimensions are these, these two listed, listed here. So one striking feature is the failure of the rigidity that one sees in, in three plus one dimensions. So remember I told you that in three plus one dimensions, we believe that all stationary vacuum black hole solutions belong to a single family known as the curve family of black holes. Now in higher dimensions, and in particular in five, there exist multiple explicit families of stationary asymptotically flat black hole solutions. Okay, and I'll mention some of this family in the next few, in the next, uh, in the next few slides. As an aside, let me also mention that one can the one can produce in higher dimensions solutions that are not asymptotically flat by just multiplying the known three plus one dimensional uh, space times by some extra compact extra dimensions. So one example is, for instance, the product of three plus one dimensional Minkowski times S one. One can also produce non asymptotically flat. Uh, black holes by taking the, the product of a three plus one dimensional Schwarzschild or three plus one dimensional curve times times S1. So the space times here are typically known as, as black strings and they're said to be asymptotically, sometimes asymptotically Kaluza Klein because of the presence of this compact uh, spatial dimension. So the second new interesting feature is that some of this new family of stationary asymptotically uh, flat black holes are expected to be classically unstable to gravitational perturbations. 
And this should be contrasted again with expected stability of the curve family in, uh, in three plus one dimensions. So to try to, to get a better understanding of these two new, these two new features, let me, uh, let me show you some examples of these of this high dimensional families and tell you what's the, their expected dynamics for, for the their nonlinear evolution. So the, the most, if you want elementary extension to, to, of, of three plus one dimensional black holes to, to higher dimensional black holes is the family of n dimensional uh, sparse black holes. So this family can be formulated in, in any dimension greater or equal than, than three plus one. And it was first presented in this paper by Tangellini for 1963. So the line element for this family is written down here in, in Sparchin coordinates. So this can be understood as a one parameter family of, of matrix parameterized by the, the mass of the black hole. And one has to replace the usual uh, matrix coefficient that you see in the three plus one dimensional Sparchin matrix by some appropriate weight in R that depends on the number of dimensions that you, that you consider. And the d omega squared here denotes the, the standard matrix on the unit n minus two dimensional, dimensional sphere. So this is a family of static of static black holes with spherical horizon topology, meaning the t equal constant slice of the event horizon is Riemannian manifold with spherical with spherical topology. And as for the four dimensional uh, sibling, higher dimensional Schwarzschild black holes are expected to be nonlinearly stable. Okay. So now, a far more challenging uh, task is to try to to write down an example of a stationary, of a family of stationary rather than just static, higher dimensional, higher dimensional black holes. And this was first achieved by this remarkable uh, work by Myers and Perry, it was published in, in 1986. Well, they formulated a new family of higher dimensional black holes that is now known as family of Myers-Perry black holes, which can be formulated in any dimension greater or equal than, than four plus one. It should be thought as the uh, higher dimensional analog of the curve of the curve family of black holes. So this is a family of stationary uh, rotating black holes. And because of the high, the, the high number of, of dimensions, the black hole can possess one or more, sorry, two or more axes of, of rotation, where the, the number of the axes available depends on the number of dimensions that you, that you consider. So this family of black holes in particular contains as a subfamily, the family of n-dimensional uh, Sfarci black holes when the rotational parameters are set to be to be equal to zero. And as for the as for the Svarci, uh, black hole, Myers Perry black holes has spherical horizon topology, and at least in certain parameter regime, this family of, of black holes is expected to be to be nonlinearly no linearly stable. Okay, so once once these two this family of Myers Perry black holes is is known, one might ent entertain the idea that all higher dimensional black holes, stationary vacuum higher dimensional black holes are described by the, by the Myers-Perry family of black holes. So in strict analogy to what happens in three plus one dimensions where all stationary vacuum black holes are described by the curve family. But this, this idea fails uh, spectacularly with, with the discovery of this, new, of this new family of black holes called, called black rings. So this was first discovered by Imperani Real in 2002 and was originally formulated in, in, four, plus one, in four plus one dimensions. And that was the first example of a stationary asymptotically flat solution for which the event horizon has non-spherical non -spherical topology. And because of this new, this new feature, this, this family can be considered as completely independent by, from this family of Myers-Perry black holes that was previously discovered. So this family of black rings will be the main, the main object of the, of the talk. And I'll, in the next slide, I'll list some of the, of the main features of these space times. But before moving to that, let me, let me mention that this first paper by Imperan Rial, they discover if you want the basic and most elementary version of this black ring space time. And later on, more general and sophisticated version of black rings have been discussing this paper and some, and some other, and some other. Okay, so let me tell you something more about this, this black rings. So black rings should be understood as a two-parameter um, two family of, 
of solutions, where here I denote the two, the two geometric parameters as R0 and, and capital R, where the two parameters need to satisfy this, this bound here. So I'll tell you in a second what's the geometric uh, meaning of these parameters and how one can, can think, about, think about these two parameters. So this is a family of explicit stationary and asymptotically flat space times. And let me stress that these are truly asymptotically flat. If you want, in the same sense, the curved black holes are asymptotically flat. So they don't possess any compact, any compact extra, any compact dimension. So the event horizon has cross-sectional topology S1 times times S2, which in a sense motivates the name black rings given to this family of space times. So this, this two parameters here are not in capital R can be can be interpreted in the following in the following way. So R0 can be thought as the radius of the S2 at the at the event horizon, while capital R can be thought as the radius of the ring, the radius of the of the S1. So as I said, this family has no analog in, in three plus one dimension and determines the failure of rigidity in two different, in two different ways. So one way is, is a topologic, is the failure of a topological rigidity. So in four dimensions, one expects the whole stationary vacuum black holes are a spherical, a spherical topology, while this family has this new ring, ring topology that one doesn't see in, in the usual three plus one dimensional setting. And the other, on the other end, the, the presence of this other independent family of minus parity black holes tells us the, the existence of black rings also breaks the rigidity within higher dimensional black holes. So one has more than one uh, families of black holes in, in five dimensions. So these black holes, these black rings, they, they possess a, an angular velocity along the, along the, the S1. And the angular velocity is constrained, is determined once these two parameters are chosen. And this explains why this family is really a two-parameter family of black holes, it's not a three-parameter, it's not a three-parameter family of, of, of black holes. And the angular velocity should be thought as balancing uh, the ring from, from, from falling, so from, from collapsing under its own gravitational uh, self-attraction. And that's why it is already determined by the two the two the two parameters here. So informally, these black rings can be can be divided in, in two subfamilies. So there are thin black rings and fat black rings. So thin black rings are rings where capital R is much larger than, than R0, and they roughly look like the one I have here in the, in the picture. While flat, fat black rings are black rings where the, the size of the two parameters is roughly roughly comparable, and they look more like, like donuts, if you want. So because of this constraint on the angular velocity that I mentioned, thin black rings are automatically slowly rotating, slowly rotating black rings. Okay. So the, the fundamental fact from the, for the dynamics of this, of this black ring solutions is that all black rings are linearly unstable to gravitational perturbations. And let me, let me maybe remark that the, the nature of the linear instability that affects black rings will depend on where the black ring is sitting within the black ring family. So in other terms, it depends on the values of these two parameters. But the claim is that for any choice of these, these parameters, so for any black ring, there will be some, some linear instability driving the evolution of the black ring under the linearized vacuum Einstein equation. So this linear instability I've been discussing a series of uh, heuristic and, and numerical works. But the aim of my work was to try to produce the first mathematical theorem that was suggestive and was suggestive of a dynamical instability for this, for this uh, family of, of space time, complementing these previous works that already observed some, some instability phenomena. Okay, so this is the, the end of the first uh, introductory part. So if you have any, any questions, you should feel free to, to stop me and, and ask. Maybe I should pause five seconds and, and give you the time to, to ask if you want. Okay, so let me let me start with the second with the second part. So the theorem that I that I ended up proving is indeed suggestive of an instability. 
but it's really suggesting a new instability that has never been uh, discussed or observed in the literature before for, for black rings. And it's affecting what we call very thin black rings. So remember the one like, like the one I showed you in the, in the picture before. So I list here the main features of this, of this instability. And then we spend the second part of the talk discussing and try to better understand this, these features. So as I mentioned, this instability will be for the first time in the context of black ring instability supported by mathematical theorem. So this instability is a nonlinear phenomenon. So it's a nonlinear instability connected to slow decay of linear perturbations. And a claim that it should, already, should, should be already manifest at the level of scalar perturbations. So meaning that it should already show up at the level of nonlinear system of nonlinear wave equation on a fixed black ring space time, where the system of nonlinear waves can be assumed to satisfy certain nice uh, conditions for, for the nonlinearities that tell us that this system is a good model for the Einstein vacuum equation. So one instance of these conditions would be the null, the null condition. And the last feature is that this instability can be ascribed to precise geometric property of very thin, of very thin black rings. And I precisely start by, by discussing this geometric property and see how this connects to an instability. So the relevant geometric property here has to do with the, with the non-geodesic structure of, of black rings and in particular with the existence of trapped geodesics. So by trapped geodesic in general, we mean a geodesic that remains in a bounded region in space for values of its, of its affine parameters. So it neither intersect the horizon nor escape to, to infinity. And this is a very familiar uh, phenomenon in general relativity as it already arises for, as it already arises for curved black holes. So when one studies geodesic motion for, for curve, one can fully separate the hamilton jacobi equation and reduce the study of geodesic motion to the study of one variable ODE with some effective potential that here I call V curve. So this potential can be shown to admit a log an extremal, to admit an extremal point, which corresponds to geodesic traveling a fixed distance from the event horizon. But the claim is that such an extremal point can only be a local maximum of the potential, which corresponds to the statement that trapping has to be unstable. So if we vary ever so slightly the initial condition of a fixed R geodesic, the geodesic that we obtain will either intersect the event horizon. So we'll either fall into the black hole or escape to, to infinity. So the existence of geodesic trapping also affect the, the, the very thin black ring, black ring space times, but with some important, with some important differences. So one new feature is that the hamilton jacobi equation does not fully, fully separate. So the best you can do is to reduce the study of geodesic motion to a two variable ODE with again an effective potential that here I call, here I call B, B ring. So as for the current case, this potential can be shown to admit one or more uh, extremal points. But now one of these extremal points can, can be a local minimum of the potential. And this corresponds to the statement that trapping for very thin black rings can be, can be stable. So now if you vary slightly the initial conditions corresponding to a geodesic traveling a fixed radial distance, you will obtain a geodesic that travels again in a bounded region in space. And if you want, oscillates in, in R around the minimum of the, of the, of the potential. Okay. So here I should stress that this, the appearance of stable trapping for, for black rings, I, I find is very, it's not trivial and, and somewhat surprising. And for stationary asymptotic flat solutions to the Einstein vacuum equation, this is really a novel feature of higher dimensional GR. So this doesn't appear in lower dimensional, in three plus one dimensional uh, general relativity. Okay. So, what does trapping have to do with the dynamics of solutions to the, to the Einstein equations and their, and their stability? So to better, to better understand this, this relation, I'll focus on a simpler toy model for the Einstein vacuum equations where trapping already plays, a crucial, already plays a crucial role. So remember that I told you at the start of the talk that the Einstein vacuum equations can be written as a system of nonlinear wave equations in the, in the metric G. But because of the nonlinear and together tensorial character of the system, 
the vacuum Einstein equations are very difficult to study from the mathematical point of view. So what one can do is to consider a very simple, in principle, simpler term model, that of a scalar linear wave equation on a fixed solution MG, whose nonlinear stability property we, we are interested in. OK. So for nonlinear purposes, one is typically interested in studying uniform boundedness and quantitative uniform decay in time for the local energy of solutions to the wave equation. So local energy will be, if you want a quantity, an L2 quantity at the level of first, all first derivatives of solutions to the, to the, to the wave equation. And the word local will refer to the fact that we are evaluating the energy over a bounded, uh, over a bounded subset omega of a T equal constant hypersurface. And it will be crucial that these, these statements will be uniform, uniform statements. So they will hold for all uh, solutions to, the, to the, the, wave, the wave equation. And in the case of decay, we won't be just interested in establishing the solutions to the wave equations decay, but we'll be interested in a quantitative statement. So in particular, we'll be interested in the rate or the rate at which this decay happens. And as it is the case for many, for many PDEs, to opt for nonlinear stability, sufficiently fast uniform decay at the linear level is, is, uh, is necessary, has to, be, has to be established. OK, so let's now go back to trapping. So trapping is a geometric property of the of the manifold interacting with high frequency components of linear waves uh, C. So in the regime of the optical approximation, one should think of waves as traveling in the proximity of an algodizic for very long, for very long time. And this should be seen as an obstruction to, to dispersion, to the dispersion of waves. And such an obstruction becomes manifest in the, in the estimates in the necessity of losing, losing derivatives of one proves decay decay statements for, for linear waves on, on space times possessing trapping. Okay. On the other end, the nature of trapping is crucial to determine how fast the uniform decay rate can, can, can possibly be. Meaning that as trapping becomes more and more stable, one expects to be able to prove slower and slower decay. Okay. And for this aspect, one can, can maybe see an analogy with the, with the problem of studying the wave equation on, on Minkowski space in the presence of a trapping obstacle. When the, when the trapping geometry of the, of the obstacle becomes worse and worse, one expects to be able to establish lower and slower decay on, on Minkowski. Okay. So without, without assumption on the nature of, of, the trapping, of the trapping on a stationary asymptotically flat space time, one expects to be able to, to, to establish conditional local decay, but only with a logarithmic decay rate. And this is a result by, by Moschidis that I, that, I, that I state here. So if you consider an arbitrary bounded set omega in, in Mg, then any sufficient irregular solution to the, to the wave equation on a general stationary synthetically flat space time Mg satisfies the following uniform energy decay inequality. So on the left hand side, we have a local energy at time, at time t. This would be less or equal than a uniform universal constant c greater than zero, where c only depends on the specific boundary set considered, but doesn't depend on time or on the specific solution to the wave equation that we are, that we are considering. So c over log t, t squared times some higher order energy evaluated at time t equal to zero. With time t equal to zero, where I where I uh, think of prescribing data for the for the wave equation. So you see that on the right hand side, you have to lose some. So this higher order energy will involve higher order derivatives of the of the initial data, and this is the actual manifestation of this fact that I mentioned here. The one has to lose derivatives in uniform energy decay statements. So such a logarithmic uniform energy. Decay will all provided that a uniform bounding is inequality of this form holds on the space time. So let me uh, stress that there might exist global obstructions for, for this uniform bounding inequality to be to be proven on a general 
stationary asymptotically fast space time. But here the claim is that if such a boundedness statement can be established, then one has to, to have at least logarithmic decay for the local energy of solutions to the wave equation. So if we, if we go back for a second to the analogy with the obstacle problem, these results should be, should be seen as the, as the analog of a classical result by Burg. The claims that regardless the, the, the geometry of an obstacle in, in Minkowski space, one can always establish local logarithmic local energy decay for linear, for linear waves. So the trapping geometry of the obstacle can be in principle as, as bad as you, as, you, as you want, but you'll always be able to prove at least logarithmic decay for waves. Where boundedness is on Minkowski is, is trivially, is trivially uh, can be trivially established ju just by, by conservation. Okay. So let's now see what one can, can say when, when more about the nature of trapping is, is known. And for this, let's go back, let's go back to, to curve to curve black holes. So remember, I told you that for curve black holes, one has geodesic trapping, but this trapping has to be unstable. And the claim that unstable trapping is compatible with fast decay of linear scalar perturbations. And it's not just compatible, but it is a theorem of the Femros, uh, Rodiansky, Shapleko, Rossman. The fast decay on curved black holes can be can indeed be, be proven. So let me let me go through the, the statement. So any sufficient irregular solution to the wave equation on a subextremal curved black hole satisfies a uniform boundedness inequality and the uniform energy decay inequality where the decay rate is one over is one over t squared. So it turns out that this decay, decay rate is sufficiently fast to prove stability of curve to nonlinear scalar perturbations. In particular, the relevance of this decay rate is that one over t squared can be integrated in can be integrated in time when you treat nonlinear system of, of wave equation. So the stability of curve to nonlinear scalar perturbations in part motivates the expectation that curve is, is nonlinearly stable as a solution to the, to the Einstein vacuum, to the Einstein vacuum equations. Okay. Now let's consider the case of very thin black rings. So I told you that black rings have been trapping, but now trapping is, is, is stable. So in the presence of stable trapping, why should you think of linear waves as trapping some effective potential well? So, and although the wave is trapping a potential well, the energy of the wave can still tunnel through, can still tunnel through the, the potential barrier and some dispersion will still, will still occur. And this dispersion is encoded precisely in the decay statement presented by, by Muskidis in his, in his, in his uh, theorem. But this general result by Muskidis leaves open the question of whether faster decay can be proven on, on black ring, ring spacetime, or so whether stable trapping may force uniform energy decay of linear waves to be, to be slow. And the main result of the, of the talk that I've proven precisely states that the decay of linear waves on very thin black rings has to be slow, and this slow decay is precisely related to the presence of stable trap. So let me, let me, stay, let me state the, the theorem. So the theorem states that uniform energy decay faster than, than logarithmic cannot possibly hold on, on black rings, on very thin black rings. So in other term, Moschini's result that I, that I showed you here has to be sharp when the space time that you consider is a very thin black ring. Okay. So it is crucial here that we use the word, the word uniform in the sense that this result is compatible with some specific solutions to the wave equation decaying uniformly in time faster than logarithmic, but you won't be able to prove a uniform decay statement faster than logarithmic that holds for any solution to the wave equation. Now, the relevance of this statement is that logarithmic decay is regarded as, as low decay in that, in that it's not, for instance, integrable in time, okay? So one expects the logarithmic decay at the linear level is not enough to prove stability results for nonlinear scalar perturbations, and thus is suggestive of a nonlinear no instability. So this should be contrast with polynomial rates on, on, uh, on curve established by the Fermos, Rodiansky, and Shapleton Rothman, and in general, we'd expect the stability of three plus one dimensional stationary uh, vacuum, vacuum black holes. 
Okay. So to to better understand how this uh, how this connects with the presence of of stable trapping, let me state a more little more uh, technical version of this of this uh, of this uh, theorem. That also that also shows you how the sharpness of Moschini's result arises. And this is the statement. This is the statement that I that I that I that I prove in, in my in my work. So provided that a uniform boundness inequality of this form holds for any sufficiently regular solution to the wave equation on a very thin black ring, So there exists the universal constant C greater than Z squared. And then we take the supremum over all possible solutions to the non-trivial solutions to the wave equation and the limb suit for T. So it seems we missed Gabriel. Not good. Hugo, you're there. Okay, my suggestion is we wait a minute or two to see if he can make his way back. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, Gabriel. What happened? You went down. So I think I think I might so my connection seems to be working fine. I don't know what happened. Can you can you hear me now? Yes, now it's perfect. Can you continue a bit so you can you can you go? Let me share again. So what's the last yeah, so the last we couldn't hear very well the, the this last so two minutes, let's say the last two minutes. Otherwise. Okay, so you do you hear this slide? Yeah, but afterwards when you were discussing the other one afterwards. Okay, this slide here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. Let's continue. Okay, sorry for that. Okay. So to, to better understand how the sharpness of the of, of Moschini's result arises and how this result connects to, how my result connects to the presence of stable trap geodesics on black rings. Let me state the theorem in this more uh, sophisticated, little more sophisticated version. So provided that a uniform boundness inequality of this form holds for any sufficiently regular solution, the wave equation on a very thin black ring, there exists a bounded set omega and the universal constant C greater than zero that depends on only on the geometric parameters of the space time and the set omega that we that we choose. So there exists a positive universal positive constant such that this inequality holds. So here we have a uh, quotient with a local energy time t over high order energy at time t equal to zero, multiplied by by log t square, and one takes the soup over all possible, over all non-trivial solutions to the to the wave equation. And the limb soup as t goes to infinity. And the claim is that this limit is lower bounded by its universal constant c, which is independent of which is independent of, of time. So the set, the set for which this, this inequality holds should be thought as localized around a stable trap, around a stable trap not So let me also briefly mention how this, this inequality implies this, this result that I that I have here. 
So if you consider any uniform energy decay statement faster than faster than, than logarithmic, let's say for instance the one that was established for curve black holes here, you could replace this ratio that you see that you see here with one over t squared. And as you take the limit for t that goes to infinity, this limit will go to zero and couldn't be lower bounded by constant independent of time. Okay. So this was the this was the the main the main result. So do you have any do you have any question? Can you hear me okay now? Yes, Gabriel. Everything is okay. Okay, good. Okay, let me let me move to the to the third part of the of the talk. So the third part of the talk will be about the claim that the new this new black ring instability may be understood as the manifestation of a more of a more general instability. So to try to to try to discuss this this claim, let me let me show you a related uh, a related problem, namely that of a study of the wave equation on current gas black holes. So current gas black holes are black hole solutions to the vacuum Einstein equations with negative with negative cosmological constant. So if one assumes reflective boundary conditions on, on current gas black holes, then these solutions admit stable, stable trapping for null, for null geodesics. And in analogy to, to, what, we, to what we saw for, for black rings, it is a theorem of Holzegel and S. Mulevichy that in a way is F to decay slowly on, on, current gas, on current gas black holes. And once again, this slow decay is related to the presence of the stable trapping phenomenon. So the theorem states that any sufficient irregular solution to the wave equation on a current gas black holes with reflective boundary conditions assumed at infinity satisfies this logarithmic uniform energy decay estimate. And such a uniform energy decay has to be, has to be sharp. And this low decay of linear scalar perturbation motivates the following uh, conjecture, the current gas black holes with reflective boundary conditions are not linearly unstable. So as the S4 black rings, the, the slow decay of linear perturbation motivates the expectation that the space times are not linearly, no linearly unstable. And let me mention that there has been some recent breakthrough work by Moschidis in the case of this conjecture for the pure, for the pure gas uh, solution uh, as a solution to the, to the einstein vlasov the einstein vlasov uh, system. So there exist other known, uh, known examples of uh, of geometries that admit stable trapping, like for instance, microstate geometries, gravitational uh, solitons and neutral compact neutron stars. And because of the presence of stable trapping on all of the space times, slow decay of linear scalar perturbations have been, has, been, has been established. And because of this slow decay, all these space times have been conjectured to, to suffer from the same kind of nonlinear instability that I, that, I, that, I discussed, that I discussed before for black rings. So given these diverse uh, geometries for which stable trapping uh, has, been, has been observed and for which slow decay has been, has been established, one may, one may uh, conjecture that the, the slow decay of waves in presence of stable trapping is a more general and, and maybe universal, universal uh, phenomenon. And I claim that this should indeed be, should indeed be, be the case for a very general class of space times. So I, so I, I believe that the expectation should be that if one considers a general class of stationary space times, which are assumed to be stable, stable trapping, then solutions and consider the, 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 the scalar linear wave equation on, on such a general class of space times, then uniform energy decay faster than logarithmic shouldn't be expected to hold. So cannot, cannot possibly hold. And this very general, this very general class of space time really should be thought as as a class of space time where nothing is, is assumed on the asymptotic structure of the, for instance, of the space time, or on the algebraic form of the matrix or the symmetries of the space time, the number of dimensions, or whether the space time possesses a black hole region or even solves the Einstein vacuum equation. So one should really think to a very general, a very general, uh, a very general geometry that admits stable trapping, and then the mere existence of stable trapping should force decay to be, to be slow. Okay, 
So in particular, the, the existence of stable trapping should be thought as suggestive of an existence of a nonlinear, the existence of a nonlinear uh, instability. So in, in particular, all stationary solutions to the Einstein vacuum equations belonging to this, to this class may be conjectured to be nonlinearly unstable as, as solutions to the Einstein vacuum equations. So there exists some other uh, higher dimensional space times for which, uh, for which uh, the, the existence of stable trap null geodesics have been, has, been, has been shown, for which I believe that one should expect the stable trap null geodesics exist. And these space times in view of this more general uh, picture should also be expected to be affected by the same nonlinear instability that I discussed. And if you want, this instability is expected should be expected to be a universal mechanism because it relies on a universal, on a universal, uh, on a universal uh, phenomenon, which is precisely this local tunneling effect that I mentioned before in the presence of in the presence of, uh, of stable of stable trapping. Okay, I don't know how much time left do I I have. Yeah, ten minutes, around ten minutes. So. Okay. Okay, so let's um. So in this time left that I that I have, I'd like to to give you the main the main ideas of the of the of the proof of the theorem. So the way the statement that we'd like to we'd like to prove is precisely the last one that I this one that I mentioned that I mentioned here. So remember that I told you that this this set omega that appears in the statement should be thought as localized around the stable trap. Are in a steady trap now, not easy. So the proof starts by fixing a set with that with that feature. So namely a set where a steady trap now geodesi can be contained in omega can be can be constructed. And the strategy would be to construct a sequence of function PCM and times TM such that PCM is a solution to the, to the homogeneous wave equation with a certain sequence of initial data that here called FM and, and HM. And TM is a sequence of time that is increasing, is becoming larger and larger with as M gets larger and, and larger. So in particular, as this exponential form in the, in the frequency. And such that this inequality that I have here holds for all T less or equal than, than TM and for M sufficiently large. So let me, so I claim that if such a sequence can be constructed, then one can prove the statement that I, then can trivially prove the statement that I that I showed you before. So in particular, if you fix any any uh, arbitrarily large time, say T star, one can choose Tm, one can choose M large enough such that Tm is greater than 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 T star, and this inequality will hold for all time less or equal than Tm, and in particular up and beyond T star. And this is precisely the statement that the lean soup of this of this sequence is lower bounded by a constant that is that is independent of m. Okay. So to construct this this sequence, we first we first construct a set with sequence of of space time functions that will denote by phi m, and that I call quasi modes. They should be thought as localized around a stable trap null geodesic containing the set in the set omega that I fixed. Okay. So I think I want to have enough time to to go through. So what I what I was planning to to go through, but let me just outline maybe the logic of the proof. So the proof should be should be thought as divided in, in two parts. So the first part of the proof would be about the the proof of existence and construction of this of this uh, quasi modes, and that's the part of the proof where most of the new elements and technical difficulties show up. While the second part of the proof will 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 show how to construct this sequence here once you have once you once you you prove the existence of these quasi modes and how such an inequality can be can be established. Okay. So the first part of the proof is the the quasi mode the quasi mode uh, construction. So you consider you start by considering a mode answers to the for the for the wave equation of of this form, where t is time is time coordinates phi and c should be thought as some general angular coordinates and x are a pair of spatial Global spatial coordinates on the space time. Here, the frequency m and j are taken to be to be integers, while omega is assumed to be real. So this is a time periodic mode answers for the for the wave equation. 
So if one considers such a mode, mode answers, for instance, for the wave equation on curve, one can fully separate the wave equation and, and, and derive an ODE for an ODE for U. But it turns out that the wave equation on black rings is not fully separable. So the best you can do is to reduce is to reduce the wave equation to a two to a two variable Schrodinger type equation of this form that you see that you see here, where you have a minus Laplacian plus potential equal to equal to U. Well, the potential here will be real valued because of the of the assumption that you have on, on omega to be to be real. Okay. So what you do, what you do then is to consider an eigenvalue problem with the Richelieu boundary condition for this Schrodinger type equation on the on the boundary set omega. Or if you want more precisely, on the boundary set obtained by intersecting omega with the T phi C equal constant hypersurface. And this Dirichlet eigenvalue problem will be will be uh, will be technically difficult to treat because it's a nonlinear eigenvalue problem. Because the eigenvalue that you see on the right hand side appears in the potential that you have on the left hand side on the left hand side as well. So what we'd like to what we'd like to to do is to prove the existence of a bound state for such an eigenvalue problem. But since you since you and, and to prove such an existence, we prove a version of the vice, of vice law for this for this eigenvalue problem. So let me let me mention that because you're considering you're considering a Laplacian plus potential operator on a boundary set, one is not free to specify an eigenvalue here on the on the right hand side. So the logic that we that we apply is to treat them as a semi-classical parameter and prove a version of by law that tells you that you can approach at some arbitrary value omega and ensure the corresponding eigenfunction is a bound state for, for the potential that you, that you have here on the left hand side. And as I said, the main difficulty arises from the nonlinear nature of the eigenvalue problem. So one element in the proof is to first consider an auxiliary uh, linear eigenvalue problem and then derive a valid version for the nonlinear problem via some perturbation argument based on an application of the implicit function theorem. And I should also stress that the existence of such, such a bound such a bound state relies crucially on the presence of a of a stably trapped null geodesic inside inside omega. Okay, so once the existence of a bound of a bound state for this problem has been established, one extends u outside the set omega to be to be equal to to be equal to zero. So we define a new function u u tilde that equals u where u is the solution to your eigenvalue problem inside omega and is equal to zero outside. So the quasi mode will, will, will coincide with this mode answers that you have here where u is the solution to this problem inside omega and is equal to zero outside. And then we apply a cutoff function close to the boundary to the boundary of omega in order to get a smooth, to get a smooth, uh, a smooth function. But now the the the, the cutoff function that, that you that you see in the definition of the of the quasi mode makes makes the quasi produces an error where one considers a quasi mode with a with a wave operator. So the, the quasi mode will satisfy the wave equation inside inside omega because it arises from this from solving this eigenvalue problem, and we solve the wave equation outside because it's equal to zero. So it's a trivial solution to the wave equation. But in the region where we where we where we cut off. It will produce it will produce an error, okay? And controlling this error will be the key the key part if you want in this in this part of the proof. And one can and one can one can establish that this error will decay will decay exponentially in the will decay exponentially in the in the frequency. Okay. So let me let me say that once once these quasimodes can be constructed and the error can be established to be small in, in exponentially small in, in frequency, one can then construct the final sequence of solutions to the one to the wave equation that we that we want. So we first think of quasimodes as solutions of inhomogeneous wave equation on the on the space-time. And then we consider a sequence of solutions to the wave equation where the initial data that one imposes for the wave equation coincides with the quasimodes as time t equal to zero. So we have a system, we have an inhomogeneous wave equations for the for the quasi mode and the homogeneous wave equations for, for PCM with the two initial data for the two equations will, will coincide to, to, to with, the, with the quasi modes. 
So by a duamic type argument, one can estimate the, the local the local energy of the difference between the two between the two between the two solutions. And using the estimate that one has on the error for the for the quasimod, this difference can be controlled in time by an expo negative exponential in the frequency. And this is the crucial estimate that then allows you to, to close this to close this this uh, this estimate here on the sequence of, of function side. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm running I'm running uh, out of time. So let me maybe summarize what I what I said. So this new instability for for black rings that I that I that I discuss is for the first time in the context of black rings instability supported by mathematical uh, theorem is a nonlinear instability coming from slow decay of of linear of linear perturbations, and it already arises at the level of of scalar perturbations. It can be ascribed to precise geometric property of, of black rings, namely the existence of stable trap null, null geodesics, and understood as a manifestation of a more general instabilities, which extends to other higher dimensional, uh, possibly other higher dimensional black holes and, and more general and more general uh, space time. Yeah, I, I should maybe uh, stop here and sorry for rushing this, this last part. I think I was running, running out of time. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much.